My name is Matt Herbert. For a bit of background, I work for a company called Biari. We do uh, commercial mathematics. We're based in Brisbane and Melbourne. And we, our goal is to use mathematics to help our clients solve real world problems. So I recently worked on a, a project for coal train scheduling, oh, crew scheduling, sorry, not the coal trains. And I'm going to, to talk about the methods that I use to solve that problem. So at the most basic level, coal trains run on a service. service. They keep doing a loop between mines and ports. And we've got crews based in depots around these ports and uh, near the mines too, sorry. So ideally, we'd want to go out and optimize the train rolling stock schedule, and we'd want to optimize our crew rosters, and we'd want to iterate between these two until we got to a, a solution that was uh, best for both. But in the real world, that's not always something we can do. Uh, we're talking to a company, and it's, it's hard to, to sell them the idea of a complete overhaul of all their systems, because it, it might optimize and might work. We believe we know what we're doing, but they're not always going to believe that. So we, we came up with a, a solution to part of their problem. So they've already got a system that um, optimizes or at least creates a, a rolling top stock train schedule for them. They've already got a system that creates a crew roster. And we were trying to come up with a solution to put those two together to maximize crew utilization. So we decided to use a network flow algorithm Part of the reason why it's, it's something different, it's fun to do different things, see if they work. Um, but we briefly tried a, a couple of different ways. Um, we, we tried a network flow algorithm, which I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we also briefly tried a, a column generation approach, which is a more classic way to scheduling. And we also attempted a constraint programming approach. Um, now, it should be said that we only had a week or two to determine uh, which way we were going to solve it, because it was a fairly tight project. So I'm certainly not saying that any of these other methods wouldn't work but the network flow one seemed the best from the start, so we went with that. Uh, part of the reason we chose it is uh, the resource start times are staggered. So the client already had a crew roster they wanted to use, and you'd have somebody signing on at 1 p.m., somebody signing on at 2, someone at 2.30. Uh, and one of the benefits we really saw from column generation was that we could remove symmetry in a problem. So if there was five people signing on at 1 p.m., we could just generate a set of candidate shifts um, for that shift type. We wouldn't need to duplicate all our work five times. Uh, but since all the uh, start times were staggered, we weren't really seeing a lot of symmetry in what the resources could do. So we decided not to go with the column generation approach. And also, the last point is more of a, a, personal, a personal thing. And that's a lot of the constraints around what crew can do what trains and where you can swap from one train to another. In a network flow approach, we deal with that by how we construct the network. Whereas in another approach, we'll probably deal with it by adding constraints to the problem that may be harder to read. For me, I find I did my thesis in network flow. I understand it really well. And I find it easier to draw pictures and diagrams and communicate that to the other people in my business, rather than just giving them a sheet full of maths. Uh, that's certainly not uh, the only reason you should choose to do, use an approach. But I found it pretty good for when I've had to communicate internally to other people what I've done and how they should change it. Um, using a network flow approach really helped me. So on that note, I'm not going to put up a wall of maths. If anyone's really interested in a formal formulation, they can ask me afterwards and I'll show them one. Uh, but I'm just using words here to describe what we did. So the goal function, the first thing is to make sure that all the tasks are covered. They're going to give us a bunch of trains. We want to make sure they're crewed. Uh, so I've made that a soft constraint in this formulation. Uh, the reason for that is, again, we're dealing with a real-world problem, a real-world system, and the people who plan the trains don't talk to the people who run the crew. And sometimes they'll just give all this information to the guy doing the scheduling, and there won't be enough crew to run the trains. Uh, he needs a system that's not going to give him back a single word saying infeasible. He needs a system that's going to come back and say, we've crewed most of these trains, but you've got one on the 27th at 3 p.m. that can't be crewed. You need to go back and do something about that. That's a general point that's very uh, good to keep in mind whenever you're dealing with a client or you need to deliver a mathematical optimization solution to a real world problem. The data is not going to be what the way you want it. A lot of the things that you want to assume will happen won't always happen. Uh, but assuming we do get good data and we can plan all the trains, then our next goal is to minimize resource usage. So their roster has uh, heaps more people than they need. 
they've got a set of full-time candidates, but they also have a whole bunch of casual workers. So we want the full-timers to be crude all the time, but we don't need to use all the casual workers. There might be 20 every day and we only need 10. So we want to come up with a solution that packs all of those shifts tightly and that doesn't use um, crew that we don't need. Then we also put a few other things in the goal function which are less important, but it's uh, reducing vehicle trips. If somebody's on a train job and he ends up out in um, somewhere out west and he needs to finish his shift then, then you need to hire another guy to drive out and pick him up, bring him home. We don't really want that. We want shifts that you sign on at your depot, you drive a train around, eventually you get back to your depot and you sign off, driving a train the whole time. So the only real constraint in a formal mathematical sense is, to, is a task covering constraint. So we want to make sure that all the tasks get done. Again, this is a soft constraint. I've got a slack variable in there. Um, but that's about it. And the rest of the constraints we handle by how we design the network. So some resources are only allowed to do some tasks. You'll have to excuse me if you've trains and tasks interchangeably in here. Um, but some trains are harder to drive than others. Not everybody who signs on can drive every train. Um, but rather than adding a, a rule saying uh, only certain people can drive certain trains, we just don't create the network uh, for those resources if they can't drive a certain train. Again, that's not saying it's, it's any more effective at solving it. It's just uh, nicer to understand. And the final one saying resources can only make legal moves between tasks. That's just basically saying you can't uh, finish a train at 2 p.m. and then get on one at 1 p.m. You know, a lot of those, a lot of the rules around legal moves are fairly obvious, but we should be stating them. <coughs> so in order to solve it using a network flow formulation, we need to turn it into nodes and arcs. So I'll go into detail about how I did that, but at the most basic level, we split a train service into segments. So trains will take around 14 to 30 hours to complete their loop of the whole system, but crew shifts are only around 12 hours long. So we need to split this train service into um, tasks that we can do individually. Uh, now, this is an algorithm that uh, treats the train service as continuous and lets you get on or off at any point. Uh, instead, we split it up into uh, sections that start and end at crew depots. So there'll usually be two or three depots, and whenever the train pulls into there, we uh, split it into separate tasks, because this is what they do in real life. They generally want people to get on and off the train uh, where they're based. So we split the train up into different segments, and then we turn those segments into nodes in the network. The resources are represented by the arcs, and the crew then flow through the trains. Uh, we use extra nodes to represent the crew sign-on and the crew sign-off, and this helps us enforce the shift time. So the goal is essentially the same as what I said before, but we put the cost on different arcs to change our goal function. So uh, for each resource, there's a specific arc that represents them being used or not, so we put the cost of the resource on that arc. So for a full-timer, we'll give that arc a low cost, make the optimizer choose them as much as it can, and then for casual shifts, we'll give that arc a much higher cost so that it only uses them if it's absolutely necessary. Uh, then for the other goal functions like light vehicle travel, whenever we have an arc that represents uh, light vehicles being required, then we'll put an extra cost on that arc. So again, constraints. The only constraints that we have are a flow conservation constraint, which is very important. We need that for this to work. Uh, and the covering constraint. So we just sum up all the arcs representing doing a task and make sure that equals one. So the way I've chosen to present this today is a bit different from what I normally do. Normally I'd show the final result of all my hard work and labor and say, look how smart I am. I've gone and made this and it works really well. Uh, but today I'm gonna go through uh, how we created the network in a bit of detail. And then I'll talk about uh, what we did to reduce the size of the problem and speed it up. Uh, hopefully some of the ideas that I've used, it will be useful to, to someone else in the future. So this is the, the diagram that I choose to use to represent my network. I've drawn this on the whiteboard at work so many times, I think I dream about it now. Uh, but I'm choosing to represent time uh, from left to right. So we can see that there's a node representing the crew sign-on and the crew sign-on before all of the tasks that I'm choosing to represent here. They sign off after the end and task one finishes before task three starts, task two is in the middle somewhere. 
So the algorithm that we used in the first instance was the most naive approach we could think of. We just wanted to get the problem uh, written up, get it solving on a computer, and prove that, that we could actually solve this problem for very small cases. So first off, we just create arcs representing sign-on. So for the crew, we create an arc to the start of every task. Again, this is the first instance, so probably doesn't seem too smart, but we'll deal with that later. Uh, but we can deal with basic rules like qualifications here. If a crew doesn't know how to drive a train, then we just don't create sign-on arcs to, that, to task representing that train. And we make sure that uh, if the crew needs to drive a vehicle to start a task, then we make sure there's enough time between the crew sign-on and the task start before we create an arc there. Uh, so we do the same at the other end. Uh, every time there's a valid end of a task, then we connect it back to the crew sign-off. And then we add another set of arcs uh, in the middle here from task starts to task ends. So these arcs represent actually doing the task. Uh, you, you might see that there's a bit of redundancy here if the crew sign-on go to task two. The only option in this case is for them to do task two and sign off. Uh, but we'll talk about pruning methods like that later. These arcs here essentially represent, as I said, doing the task. And so in order to figure out if a task is done, we sum up these arcs over every resource. And if that's one, then we're doing that task at some point. So we also create a arcs between tasks. So if task one finishes and it's finishing before task three starts, then we create an arc between task one and task three. The most, uh, the most basic implementation of this, which I'm going to show here, is for task one ending, we create an arc out to each new task that could be done from task one. So in a case where we have a couple of items, that seems pretty fine, but when we get to a weekly plan, that, that turns into a lot of arcs. But again, here we can deal with um, light vehicle travel. If task one end is at a different place to task one, task three start, then we'll only create this arc if those times are far enough apart that you can take a vehicle there. We don't need any extra constraints dealing with light vehicle travel or where the times are. We just don't create those arcs if it wouldn't be feasible. Uh, so the final arc that we create is one backwards in time at the bottom. And this arc represents whether or not you actually do the, sorry, whether or not the crew is actually used. Uh, you could do this with a constraint on the sign on or off node. Uh, could add an extra variable saying, if the crew is used, set this variable to one. I like adding another arc in, because I think it's more elegant. Uh, and it, it just plays off the existing uh, flow conservation constraints all through the network. If the arc at the bottom's used, then the arcs at the top will have to be used somehow. If the arcs at the top are used, you have to flow through the bottom. Because uh, this arc is the only one that goes backwards in time, it must be included in any cycle that's solved in this network. And because this arc must be included we, included, we can put the cost of the crew onto this one. So this is what the final network would look like for a single crew and three tasks. And feasible solutions to this are formed by um, cycles in this network. So here's an example of crewing task one. It represents the crew signing on, completing task one, signing off, and going back to the start. Also complete task two. And the optimal solution would be signing on, completing task one, then going to task three, completing that, and signing off. So it's fairly straightforward. There's nothing too tricky going on here. So that's good. I mean, I've shown you an example with, with one crew member and, and three tasks to do. And it's got 11 arcs, which is 11 variables. It solves really quickly. Um, but there's no guarantee that it's going to solve really quickly when we get to a real-world case. Uh, so I've drawn a slightly bigger picture of my diagram, and I just want to illustrate what happens is this really naive formulation uh, when we try and solve it on a slightly bigger case. This is only 18 tasks as well. This is nothing like a real-world problem. So if I go through the same process, I'm not going to go through it slowly because I'm sure you all understand it. But you can see already that there's just... There's stuff everywhere. This is, this is really bad. Um, it's, there's probably going to be a lot of symmetry in there. I feel like, I feel like there's, there's just so many paths there that are probably representing the same kind of information. 
Then we get when we get to the last step, adding arcs between different tasks, um, it's just it's just a mess. So I find I didn't um, I didn't draw anything like this when I when I was actually designing the algorithm. I went and I I drew up my little case with three or four tasks on the whiteboard and uh, drew arcs around it and made sure the logic was all right. Then I was happy with myself and I went out and designed it and I figured if there's a problem I'll deal with it later. Uh, whereas the fairly basic exercise like this can can demonstrate pretty early, you know, that there's a problem here that there's just too much information, and drawing out your problem in, in any way that you can, uh, can be a really useful exercise at the start of your project. So what kind of, what kind of size are we actually looking at? So uh, at the client's office, they wanted to use this for a weekly train plan. And so in a weekly plan, there's around 500 shifts. Again, not all of these are going to be used. Uh, but that's the number that we need to look at in our optimizer. And when they take their weekly trains and we chunk them up into different segments that, um, uh, based on the, where the depots are, the crew would change, we get around 1,500 train segments. And each crew member can do around some combination of around 150 segments. <coughs> Sorry. So if we look at that, then each of the segments in each of the crew has two nodes. We've got 4,000 nodes. Uh, then we make a network for each of the crew Sorry, that should be a T squared, not a T2. Um, but we have around the order of T squared arcs when we connect all the tasks to all the other tasks. Uh, we've got a sign on arc for each task, a sign off task for, arc for each task, a doing the job arc for each task. And this gets just really big really quickly. And we end up with uh, 11 and a half million binary variables, which is just, you know, that's not a good idea. It's never a good idea to have a problem like that. That's fine. Like I said, we went into this and we tried to make a, the most basic implementation we can. Just make sure the problem's solved. It's always feasible. It's just might take the life of the universe to get to the answer. But that's all right. Now we can figure out how we can speed up the problem. So it might sound obvious, but as a general rule, we want to find a way to express the same rules and the same information with smaller variables, well, fewer variables and a smaller network. And we'll start this by tackling the, the arcs that are most common. So the arcs connecting every task to every other task. Probably don't need that. It's making, it's growing at uh, order of t squared, so that's going to be heaps. So how can we reduce the number of them? So we did that by introducing waiting arcs. Now, waiting arcs are nothing new to anyone who's done a network flow problem before. It just represents someone being at the same location and moving forward in time. Uh, one of the reasons I didn't put them in when I first attacked this problem is a lot of the other network flow work I've done in supply chain or maybe even ship scheduling, uh, there was a clear way to discretize time. So for a ship, a liner ship, we maybe only care about what it's doing every day. Uh, for, uh, say, maybe for a grain moving company where we're looking at a really high level supply chain, we might only care what it's doing every week. Uh, but in this case, we really care about what trains are doing every minute. We care about there's a train pulling at 9, 9.01, 9.07, and if I broke all of the time periods up into one minute intervals, we'd end up with just as many variables anyway. So we need a, a smarter way to discretize time, but we still want to bring in this, this waiting network. So the first thing we looked at is well, we're creating all these arcs. What are they actually deciding? What are they, what are they telling us? And how can we change that decision? So at the end of every task, we create all of these arcs. And the, the question they're trying to answer is, which task do we do next? So because uh, our resource flow is limited to one, uh, we're assuming we can only pick one of these arcs. So we're really deciding where do we go next. And the number of options we have there is equal to the number of tasks, which can be massive. And we also note that if we flow to the start of a task, there's no decisions to be made there in the, the way that we'd set the network up. If we go to the start of a task, we're pretty much assuming that we're going to do it. So we want to change that decision. Which task do we do next? has too many options. We want something a bit simpler. So instead, we we get rid of all those arcs, and we just make two arcs. So I've changed the, um, I've changed the question from being about the end of a task to the start. 
So if we finish a task, then we just flow straight to the start of the next one. And then we say here, do we do this next task? So if we do this task, then we just take the existing arc from before, flow through to the end. But our only other option is, no, we don't do this task. We're just waiting here. So if, uh, if this task that I'm looking at starts at 901, and then the next task starts at 907, we don't really care what the crew is doing at 902, 3, 4, 5, and 6. We only really care what they're doing at each of the decision points. In this case, there's, there is a decision to be made uh, every time a task starts. So in effect, we're drawing this waiting network in the dotted lines, and we're using it to discretize time uh, in units of where the task starts. So again, if we've chosen not to do the first one, then we wait until the second one, and there, again, there's only two arcs. One decision to be made, do we do this task or do we keep waiting? And then we keep filling this pattern down through the network. And you can already see that it looks much, much neater and nicer than the previous one. So the only thing we need to do now is sign on and off. Uh, for a crew member before, we had them signing on to every possible task. We don't need that now that we've got this nice waiting arc structure through the network. So all we really need to do is create an arc signing on to the first task. The first task here really represents the first time the crew's able to do some work. Uh, we connect them to the first time they're able to do some work. They don't need to work then. They can, or if they choose not to, they can just flow through this dotted line through the network until they reach a time when they do want to do their task. Uh, for sign-offs, if the task is finishing early enough to rejoin this waiting network, then it can just wait through the network and then flow out to the sign-off node. Uh, if it's finishing later than this waiting network exists, then we'll just create the existing arc from before that flows to sign-off. Although, before I made a point that uh, the starting arc, uh, sorry, the starting nodes in the previous example didn't really do anything, uh, you'll notice now the end nodes don't really do anything. Uh, if for each start node, we have a decision to either work or not. Uh, if we decide to work, well, the only option there is to flow into the end node. Flow conservation means we then have to flow out of the end node. There's only one arc to do so on. So that end node's really superfluous. Uh, another thing to look about when you're trying to optimize your network flow models is where are there no real decisions to be made? Uh, adding the nodes in might make it easier to describe. It might even make some of the constraints easier to write. But if you're having performance problems, uh, removing them can speed up the problem. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes Cplex or Garobi will just notice that and pre-solve and do all the work for you. Uh, but it's always good to not leave those things up to chance. So we've then noticed that these end nodes have no decisions to be made. So instead of creating an arc and end node another arc, let's just turn that all into a single arc. And then we end up with this. So it remains to be shown that uh, this network can describe all of the feasible solutions that the previous one could. I'm not going to go into a detailed proof of that, but I'm going to show you a few examples and hopefully you, you trust me that it does. Uh, so if we just wanted to crew the first task, we'd uh, select these arcs in the solution, you sign on, you complete the task, and then you just follow the waiting network to the end. If we wanted to choose some subset of those tasks to crew, uh, we could do so like this. Uh, we crew the first task, we wait for a while, jump on another train, wait for a while, jump on another one. Or more likely, we'd be crewing three tasks in the same train service, which would look something like this. Uh, now, there is one caveat that I've kind of skipped over here, and that is uh, for each of the starting locations, it's assumed that you'll be able to uh, do the next task in line. So if we're at task three and we choose to wait, we're assuming that we can do task four. We're assuming there's no extra information that we're not missing there. Uh, in the case of the train crew planning that I was doing, this is correct. But if you're doing something like uh, delivering uh, truck delivery drivers, they might have union rules around they have to work for four hours and take a break then work for another four hours. Uh, in that case, you, you would have to do something different because you may be at the start of the third task and then you'd have to, just because you can do the 
a task starting at 3 a.m. doesn't always mean you can do the task starting at 4 a.m. In that case, you'd probably want to separate that resource into two shifts and figure it out some other way. So, so how does this new formulation go? If we look at our, our original problem size, we've got 500 shifts, 1,500 train segments, and our problem's a lot smaller. So the number of nodes decreases. That wasn't really a huge concern before anyway. Well, we've got rid of that nasty t squared term in the size of the problem. Now for every task, there's just two arcs. There's one that choosing, choosing to do that task, one choosing not to do that task, and then there's a couple of other arcs. So this gives us 150,000 binary variables. That's still a fair bit, but it's going to grow a lot less than previously. <clears throat> so we, we threw, this, threw a whole week's data at this uh, formulation with 150,000 binary variables. And we managed to get it to solve to optimality, but it took five, six hours. It took the better part of a night. Uh, now again, this is, this is for weekly planning. That's probably OK. Guys can run it overnight, come back in the morning to a plan. Uh, but they really wanted something, especially in testing, that they could run pretty quickly, maybe around half an hour. So we looked at our network and we decided we've, we've done a pretty good job of making it smaller. We could maybe squeeze it a bit harder, but we're going to throw a heuristic over the top. Uh, so again, this is a fairly general heuristic. I'm not talking about anything too tricky. It's something that you can probably use in other problems as you see it. Um, so we're going to solve the problem a couple of days at a time. Now this relies on the assumption that uh, if we're planning a whole week of crew schedule, what Bob does on a Monday probably isn't going to affect what some other guy does on a Saturday. Uh, it's, it's not completely true, but it's, it's true often enough for this to be a good idea. So anytime you're, you're dealing with a problem that has a really long time horizon, you can probably consider chunking it up into, into daily bits. So we decided to solve this um, two days at a time. So the cruise shifts are around half a day, so two days is usually long enough to, to include a shift and the things that will likely affect that shift. Uh, and that got it down to around 30,000 variables, which would solve quite quickly, anywhere between uh, a minute to 10 minutes. It's a bit unpredictable due to just the nature of branch and bound, but it would solve quite fast. So uh, it might not be a good idea to just take your problem and chunk it up into completely disparate problems and then solve them separately. So we're going to do a couple of semi-intelligent things around getting this to solve in a smart way. So we're still going to solve the whole problem at once, but we're only going to force part of the solution to be integer. If we completely discounted the rest of the problem and just solve these first two days, then we might not get a, a particularly smart solution. But if we relax the integrality constraint on most of it, uh, then it'll still be taking the rest of the problem into account, just not at the complexity that uh, the non-heuristic method was using. So again, we've chosen, uh, I've chosen two days. Uh, I'm just representing this again as one cruise shift. Chunking your problem up into fifths of a cruise shift will probably not get you a good solution, uh, but it'll do for, for showing here. So let's say each of these uh, columns represents a day, and we're solving a problem where we've got integrality across two days and the rest continuous. So we'll solve it, and we'll, we'll probably get a solution like this. Uh, it's chosen to sign on, wait a bit, do a job, wait a bit, do another job, and then it's just done some fractional variable solution at the end. It's chosen to do half of a job up here and half a job down there, and, and that's going to happen. That's fine. We don't, we don't really care about that now. We're assuming that any inaccuracies in, in the last day's plan isn't going to affect what the guy on a Monday is doing. So, all right, we've said those light blue ones don't really matter, and that's fine. But this decisions near the boundary might be a problem. So it's made an integer decision about this second task here. But it's done that with knowledge that it can then break up and make fractional variables afterwards. So, so we don't really trust that either. We need to, I, I've made the assumption that uh, the solutions will be valid if we're sufficiently far from the continuous variables. And so I'm going to say that the first day is probably pretty good. We've solved 
we've solved one day and then there's two shifts worth of extra integrality that, that'll probably make that first day a good solution. And then the extra integrality is more of a buffer and then the rest is just probably a bad solution. So we take this and we, we only save our result for the first day. And then we say we're going to say solve Tuesday and Wednesday with integer solutions and then the rest of the week as continuous. And so that's why I refer to this as a rolling horizon heuristic because we move this integrality window forward through the problem. At each stage, we've got a subproblem that's much easier to solve than the complete problem. And because we're only locking in some of the integer solution, it helps us get a, a much better solution. So I can go through my short manual animation, showing it moving forward. And eventually, we lock in a solution where we get uh, integer the whole way through. So that's good. It solves a lot quicker. It solves in around half an hour compared to about five, six hours. Uh, but again, it is a heuristic, so what's the, uh, what's the reduction in performance? So in the cases that we were using, I saw a variance of around one or two shifts a week in the solution quality. Uh, for the client that we were talking to, that was, that was fine. I mean, when you go into a real planning environment and you make your crew plan, uh, changes are going to happen on the day. Trains are going to be cancelled. Trains are going to be delayed. And one or two shifts is usually the variation that they see that just in their normal plan that they can't account for. Uh, but again, we designed this and gave the client the option to use the heuristic or not. So most of the time they do because they want to run a quick plan in 30 minutes, hand it over to some other people. There'll probably be feedback coming back to them the next day. They want to run it again. They want to play around with it a bit but they can always run an optimal solution overnight. Uh, in some cases, we've seen them using this for uh, more complex uh, what-if scenario analysis. And in that case, they'll just run a whole bunch of solutions to optimality overnight and analyze them in the morning with management. But for the week-to-week -week planning, the 30-minute heuristic solution with a buffer of one or two shifts is, is good enough for them. They're quite happy with it. And I've just got a note there that uh, the way they were planning beforehand would take half a day to a day for them to come up with a crew plan for a whole week. Um, there'd be guys sitting around with handmade Excel tools or pen and paper in some cases, and the, the speed up that they can get in their planning techniques um, just from using this are, are really good. Uh, so I've got one more slide. I'm probably finishing a bit early, but I'm happy to take plenty of questions. Uh, so this is uh, some other items that we've talked about with the client and in most cases implemented them as well. Uh, so the slide, I, uh, the presentation I showed before was the most basic problem. You take your crew, you take your trains, you put them together, you get a feasible solution. But feasible doesn't always mean, or even an optimal solution, doesn't always mean exactly what they want to use on the day. So the, really, the only objective function in, existing, in the existing problem was pack the crew shifts as tight as you can with work. So that was, the, that was the motivator for the first point on this slide, to restrict the number of crew changes in a train service. So when the, when the optimizer was running, it would sometimes give a solution where, say, seven out of eight crew were just getting on a train, going out to a mine, coming back, getting off. I was giving them really good utilization, and then one crew would get on and he would change trains about nine times in his shift and then jump off, just because the train schedule happened to work out such that all of those nine trains would line up perfectly with him, and he would get 90% utilization in his shift, but in a real world you probably don't want a guy jumping on nine different shifts in his, um, nine different trains in his shift when most people would only get on one or two. It's also a, um, a result of that is every time you want to change trains, you have to slow the train down, you have to stop it, you have to wait for the other guy to get there, he might be delayed. It can take up to 20 minutes every time two people want to swap trains. And this formulation assumes the train schedule is static, even though that's not the case in real life. Uh, and that assumption is fine as long as we're not uh, changing crew too often, because changing crew will change the schedule in, in real life. So their real schedules have enough buffer in them that they account for one crew change or two. So that's fine, as long as this optimizer is doing that, then it'll fit within their existing schedule. But if it asks for nine, 
nine lots of 20 minutes adds up to three hours pretty quickly and, and they get delayed. Uh, so, so we had a side constraint essentially saying all of those working arcs that weren't dotted uh, sum up all of them across a train service and restrict it to one or two. Uh, then some of the others I probably won't go into it in as much detail, but they wanted to, to only change from empty trains to loaded trains. Um, again, this is just a rule that they have. You can probably squeeze out a bit better crew utilization by changing trains a lot more willy-nilly, but it uh, creates restrictions on the day of operations. You want a crew plan that's fairly simple that you can call up a guy and say, hey, you're on train one, then you're on train five. That's it. It's less likely to stuff up or be prone to delays. So a lot of these side constraints are just around making a more robust solution, even if it doesn't have quite the same utilization. Uh, we also added in a rule for layover crew. So that's when a crew jump on at their depot, they drive a train out to somewhere else, they stay the night there, and then they come back the next day. Uh, this was just done by adding two shifts with different sign-on and off locations, and then making it so that if you incurred the cost for one, you had to use both. And the final one was to prioritize spare time at shift ends. So uh, this is, again, an issue around robustness. Uh, if you have an 11-hour shift and you've got 10 hours of work for that shift, then you would prefer that that extra hour is at the end of the shift. So in a planning environment, it doesn't really matter. You've got 10 out of 11, 89% utilization. That's great. Uh, when you're dealing with a real-world scenario, if a guy signs on in the morning and he waits an hour before his train, that's just wasted time. You're not going to do anything with that time. The only way that uh, the day is going to change that is if the train arrives an hour early. And generally, in an operational environment, you're not worried about trains arriving early. There's going to be delays. They're all going to be late. So if that guy's got his plan, he's got an hour spare at the end, then the train's probably going to be delayed. If it's delayed up to an hour, you don't really care. He's not going to be stuck in whoop whoop, and you're not going to have to relieve him on the day. He's got an extra hour to come home before he runs out of shift time. It's a more robust solution for delays. Uh, we ended up implementing that not by changing the optimizer. We didn't really want to take a solution with lower utilization just because it had more spare time. We just added a post-processing method where we ran the standard optimizer across all the data, got a whole bunch of utilizations, and in that are what the shifts would look like, so where they were going, what trains they changed with. And then we just searched through the available shifts to move that work later when it was feasible. So that's the content of my presentation. I'd like to thank you all for giving me a chance to